It is time for an update of what might be my most popular video ever, which Clean Flight flight controller is best. And I want to update that video because a few things have changed that changed the results uh, for a few of these flight controllers. And there are a few other flight controllers that have come out since I made that video that I think are worth your attention. I'm not going to do a whole exhaustive version of that video, but I do want to do just a brief update to sort of bring you up to speed on some changes that have happened since I made that video. Let's get into it. One of the things that I marked boards down for in my original review was if they use a virtual COM port or VCP. Virtual COM port means that instead of having a dedicated chip to do the USB to serial conversion to let the, the microprocessor on the board talk to the USB port, they use software. The advantage of VCP is that all of your hardware serial interfaces are available all the time for whatever you want to use them for, whether that's talking to your serial receiver or talking to your black box device or your, your OSD or your GPS receiver, whatever. They're all available. Typically, these boards have three. And if you use VCP, you get to use all three of those for whatever you want. But if you don't use VCP, you only get to use two of those for whatever you want. And one of them is basically perpetually tied up uh, with for the USB port. You can still get some use out of it, but it's not as flexible. The disadvantage of VCP is twofold. First of all, some people have trouble with the VCP drivers. Other people have no trouble at all. And that's sort of a coin toss whether you're going to get unlucky on that or not. So I don't consider that either positive or negative. I haven't had any trouble with VCP drivers. Other people have huge problems. You got to just kind of hope you're not one of the ones who has a problem. But the real thing I marked VCP off for was that BL Heli pass through was not supported on VCP interfaces, which means that if you want to program your BL Heli ESCs, you have to disconnect them from the flight control board, which is a real hassle, especially on very small boards like a Mixuco or a Krieger or a QQ190 frame, one of those pure X racing frames where everything is direct soldered. Basically, from my perspective, BL Heli pass through is an absolute must have feature. It makes it so much easier to work with your copter to program your ESCs etc. And since VCP did not support BL Heli pass-through, I basically ruled out any board that used VCP. Well, as of Betaflight 261 and BL Heli 14.5, VCP supports BL Heli pass-through, and that mark has gone off the record. So boards like the Luminaire Lux, which use VCP, no longer get a ding for that. That board becomes more accessible, in my opinion. The other thing that I marked boards off for in my original video was using the MPU 6500 or 9250 gyro chip. Uh, and the reason for that is that that chip has a slightly worse noise rating. Now there has been some real questions and I've also been uncertain as to whether that actually has a practical effect. My conclusion has been that if you are willing to tune around it, in other words, maybe you have slightly less D gain, or maybe you have to put vibration damping on your flight controller instead of hard mounting it, that these chips shouldn't be completely ruled out. And I think other pilots, I think Boris has come to that same conclusion, but there's still a lot of suspicion and some maybe even evidence that the 9250 and the 6500 gyro are not ideal for high vibration environments like a quadcopter. And I still shy away from them, although I don't I don't rule out these chips entirely. I think they can be made to work, but I think you're more likely to run into some problem that you then have to solve as opposed to the 6000 and the 6050 gyro, which seem to work better in these very noisy environments. So I personally still would not choose a board that had the 6500 or the 9250 gyro in it, like the Luminaire Lux or the SP Racing F3 boards, which use the 9250. I personally would not choose one of them, but I don't think that's necessarily an absolute deal breaker if you just really love this board and want to use it. So let's just go through some of these boards. We've got the Lumineer Lux at $40. It does not have onboard data flash. And it does have VCP, so you will have a spare UART if you did want to use an external black box device, that's your call. And it has a really unique form factor with these edge launch pins that can make for a really low profile and clean install. Or 
easy direct soldering if that's what you're going to go for. It does use the 6500 gyro. For that reason, I personally wouldn't choose it, but it's a, it's a fine board for what it is. The Motolab Cyclone also uses VCP, and I would have rejected it until Betaflight 261 and BL Heli 14.5. Now it is actually probably maybe my second favorite board uh, that's out there now for clean flight. Uh, it has an SPI gyro, which means it can run at full 8 kilohertz, which is a real selling point. Uh, it's at $37. It's pretty affordable. And I really like the pad layout. The pad layout is very smartly designed and very clever. Uh, so, so I think this would be probably my second favorite flight controller available today. My first favorite flight controller available today is the X-Racer F303. I really like the layout of the X-Racer F303. And I really like the price, $27. It's a very good price. I think it's one of the cheapest F3 flight controllers out there. It has on board 128 megabits or 16 megabytes of data flash, which means you have a decent amount of logging time if you want to do black box and you don't want to use an open log device. That's nice. It does not have an SPI gyro, so you cannot run at 8 kilohertz, but you can run at 4 kilohertz, which is pretty good. Is 8 kilohertz better? That depends on too many factors to go into right now. But I, I think the difference between 2 kilohertz and 4 kilohertz is, is small, and the difference between 4 kilohertz and 8 kilohertz may be even smaller. But it may be there if some of my recent flight testing has any indication. So we've got the X Racer F303 and the Moto Lab Cyclone. I think those for me are number one and number two. Number one, because just on price, I mean, price is a factor for us, uh, for most people, <laughs> and it's pretty featureful for the price. And then if I really, really wanted 8 kilohertz gyro, I would go with the Cyclone. The Cyclone has a really great hardware layout. Uh, one of the things, a, a good example of that is that UART2 is used for serial input, but the transmit pin for UART2 is broken out on the board. So that if you wanted to use UART2 just as a general purpose UART, you would have the option to do that. A lot of other boards will dedicate a UART to a serial receiver, and they'll just have three pins. 5 volt uh, ground and receive, they won't break out the transmit pin because they're like, you don't need transmit for a receiver. So it's really nice that Moto gives you the option here. Another board that is worth talking about is the SP Racing F3 Evo. Now the SP Racing F3 Evo uses the 9250 gyro, which means that it has the worst noise spec and you might have to tune around to all those problems I talked about before. But what makes this board really interesting to me is it has an onboard SD card reader. And if you are a black box junkie like me, that is awfully compelling. You get all the speed of a data flash chip because it's built on board and you get all the size of an SD card. So you can log as fast as you want, as long as you want. And that is really compelling. And for that, I would be willing to consider going with this board, even though it has the 9250 gyro, which is not my favorite. Now, there's also the SP Racing F3 Mini, which also uses the 9250 chip with the worst noise spec, and it doesn't use the SPI interface, which is sort of the whole point of using the 9250, is that it has SPI. So I would not choose the F3 Mini, because it has the worst chip, and it doesn't even give you the advantage of that chip, which is the 8 kilohertz gyro update rate. Here, the F3 Evo has the 9250 chip, and it lets you use the 8 kilohertz gyro update rate because it has an SPI interface to the chip. So this is the one I would pick if I wanted this onboard SD card reader, and I wanted 8 kilohertz. It also has the built-in race transponder, the IR race transponder. That's nice. It may not, maybe not going to use that if you don't race but it is nice to have. Uh, and I would sort of bite my lip and accept the worst noise spec and the potential tuning problems that would come from that. Potential, not guaranteed in every case, in order to get that SPI card reader. But if, for example, there was an F303 out there, which uses the 6050 chip, and it had 8 kilohertz gyro, maybe it used the 6000 chip for 8 kilohertz gyro, and it had an onboard SD card reader, well, I would buy that instead. I I don't know. I It seems like some of the SP3 boards have had hardware problems in the past. 
I know that the Gen 1, just the regular SP Racing F3 did. And then I heard some things about the SP3 Mini having issues with uh, with boards getting out, with you know components badly soldered, components crooked. Um, so I, uh, you know, like when I look at the Motos, it seems like Moto is a very very solid hardware designer, and his boards are robust and solid. I've never heard of you know DOA or boards failing prematurely in the field. Whereas it seems like I hear those stories about the SP3 and it kind of doesn't inspire a lot of confidence in me. That being said, the feature set of this board is really compelling and is, it may be worth a try if, if that's something that, that appeals to you. We've got the ready-made RC Seriously Dodo. I, the, I like the Dodo. The Dodo is a solid board that got a lot of things right, but I think time has moved on. Many of the things that the Dodo did right other cheaper and just as well-designed boards are doing right, and at, at 50 bucks, it's hard to argue that you should buy the Dodo instead of some of the other boards that are out there. So that's my opinion about the Dodo. I only include it here because a lot of people do use the Dodo, and it's a very prominent board. I personally think that you can get all of the good features of the Dodo in a cheaper board without giving up very much. And then we've got the Black Sheep TBS Power Cube, which I include here because a lot it intrigues a lot of people. This idea that you've got this all-in-one flight controller and ESC stack. What could be simpler and easier, for, especially for a build like a Pure X Racer, where you just don't have a lot of room to work with? And I think that there's an audience for this board. But that audience isn't me. Number one, I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty. I like getting my hands dirty and doing a complicated build. So I'm not will I'm not I don't desire to pay extra for convenience in this case. And the flight controller here is probably fine. I don't know anything bad about it. I don't know anything good about it. I really don't know a lot about it. But it's probably fine. But the real thing about this setup is that I have no confidence that these are spectacular ESCs. I know that they can run Simon K, which tells me they have an Atmel chip, which tells me that they're probably pretty mediocre. There are very few Atmel ESCs that, that do very well. The only one that I know of is the High Volt, uh, the Afro High Volt, and that does well because it has a dedicated gate driver, which almost no Afro ESCs do. Okay, so I suspect that these are very mediocre ESCs. And as important as ESCs are to a copter's handling, I just, I don't see, I don't see any reason to compromise your, uh, your copter in that way. In fact, frankly, you're paying a lot for the privilege of compromising the handling of your copter with what I suspect are very mediocre ESCs, 140 bucks. So for 140 bucks, I mean, you can get a, a take your pick of flight controller for 35 bucks and to get a very good ESC in the price range of say 12 to 15 dollars so let's say 60 bucks for the ESCs 60 bucks for a really top notch ES set of ESCs and a flight controller for 35 you've spent 95 bucks and you have any flight controller you want and the best ESCs on the market or very close to it and another 50 bucks in your pocket it doesn't seem really compelling to me so that, I mentioned this because it's very popular and I know people are going to ask, but that's the reason that I don't really feel that this uh, is a contender. And there you go. That's your rundown of the sort of big big ones where things change. Anyone that has VCP, uh, I changed my opinion of it because v, they now can do BL Heli pass-through, but I'm still not a huge fan of the 6500 gyro on the Lux or the 9250 gyro on the SP Racing F3. For the Cyclone, the Cyclone is back in the running. I love the Cyclone now that I can do BL Heli pass-through using the Cyclone. I love the fact that it has an 8 kilohertz gyro. I love the hardware design and the board layout. I love everything about it. I just don't personally buy it because for me, the 8 kilohertz uh, the 8 kilohertz gyro rate is not enough to put pay another 10 bucks for the flight controller when I can get it do 4 kilohertz on the F303 for only $27. That's, that's, that's my prerogative. Uh, and things like the Dodo and the TBS, I feel like they're overpriced given the state of the market right now and that time has kind of passed them on. So uh, there you go. Uh, if they think there's something I missed or something I got wrong, leave it in the comments. And in the meantime, happy flying.